anticipating ecological surprises. By ecological surprises, I mean the sorts of phase shifts from coral-dominated systems to usually macroalgal-dominated systems that several of the speakers have, have already uh, been talk, talking about. Um, the sort of phase shift that uh, Bob just described from a coral-dominated system uh, on your left to the macroalgal-dominated system on the right has been occurring now uh, around the world. It's happened to uh, a much greater extent, and it began earlier on in the Caribbean. And like Bob, I began to work uh, earlier in my career in the Caribbean. I think the Caribbean story has been uh, a very powerful one for coral reef managers around the world. And so now I think every coral reef manager worth their salt is aware that these sorts of regime shifts can happen. And I think there's an increasing awareness of the sorts of drivers um, that can cause them. Um, an issue that's uh, come up in several of the talks is, is the, uh, the concept of resilience. People talk about an erosion of resilience of the coral-dominated system um, and then some disturbance which tips the system into an alternative state, usually a macroalgal-dominated state. I would just like to make the point that this, this system here can also be um, very resilient. So resilience is not necessarily something you want to bolster. You might actually want to erode it if you're in that condition so that you can get back over to uh, a more desirable configuration of, of species. Um, I'm just going to, I included uh, the next two slides which uh, give you my personal experience of a reef I was studying um, going belly up uh, before my very eyes. So this is a, a picture, it's actually uh, 16 merged photographs of, of 16 quarter square meter um, photographs taken in Jamaica in 1981 um, when I was uh, a PhD student. It's quite uh, a deep uh, water reef. This is taken at uh, 35 metres. And I'm going to show you this same place uh, a few years later. And I want you to focus on that coral there because it's virtually the only one that survived. So that's the exact same plot. Um, that quadrat was permanently positioned on the reef. And I have thousands of before and after pictures like that. I don't have any pictures showing a transition like this back to coral dominance. Although uh, I believe it can uh, be made to happen, but it just doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. So I think we can all uh, identify the three major threats to coral reefs, and basically that's uh, a lot of the topics we'll be talking about um, for the rest of today and tomorrow. Over-harvesting, which is sometimes called top-down effects, declining water quality, also known as bottom-up effects, and increasingly um, climate change. Um, the terms top-down and bottom-up refer to the impacts that human activities have on the structure of food webs, and I'll, I'll come back to that um, point uh, in a moment. So Bob talked about uh, how to kill a reef, and uh, I'm going to simplify what he said by offering you uh, a recipe, um, not a naked chef recipe, but a fully clothed marine biologist's recipe. Um, if you remove the lawnmowers, Bob talked about parrotfish, and uh, Dave Bellwood will uh, embellish on those issues tonight. Um, if you fertilize the reef, and we have a whole session tomorrow on uh, runoff issues, both of those promote algal blooms. And then the third element of our recipe is wait for something bad to kill the corals. And increasingly, of course, that something bad is, uh, is coral bleaching. Um, there is an unhealthy focus among coral reef scientists on what killed the reef, what killed the coral. And, and I've read lots of papers, particularly from the Caribbean, which include mortality from cyclones or hurricanes as part of the reason why Caribbean reefs have undergone regime shifts. I think that completely misses the point that what has happened in, Car in Caribbean reefs and elsewhere is that their resilience has been lost. It's not just a question of enhanced mortality, but in many cases, it's also an issue of recruitment failure. So if you think of the decline of coral populations and fish populations, which was Morgan Pratchett's point, in a demographic sense, it's not just what killed them, it's the balance between mortality 
and birth rates or recruitment rates. Um, that's the issue. So we also need to focus in terms of our potential management interventions on issues like uh, replenishment, recruitment, and the processes like grazing that are involved uh, in those. And so the result of those three interacting things is that algal blooms can uh, replace um, the corals. I mentioned a moment ago food chains, and, and this is mainly for the non-biologists uh, uh, in the room. This is a, a fairly idealized uh, food web structure for a coral reef. This is a very flawed model. You still see in the literature food models that don't include the top predator in every ecosystem on the planet, and that is, of course, um, people. At the top of this food chain, we've got top predators, things like sharks, and Howard Choate and uh, Sean Connolly will be giving presentations about what's happening to shark populations on the Great Barrier Reef. Further down, we've got herbivores, things like parrotfish and, uh, and sea urchins here and here, and dugongs and manatees, herbivorous turtles. And at the bottom, we have primary producers, um, algae, seagrasses, corals, uh, and so on. The arrows there show you uh, transitions or transfer of energy or who eats whom, basically, and we can go out and, and measure those. But, of course, many coral reefs today look like this, where the top predator people have completely distorted the structure of food webs. And there's uh, increasingly a phenomenon often called fishing down the food chain, where a large megafauna has long since disappeared. So, too, have large predatory fish, things like gropers and snappers. And now most of the world's coral reef fisheries, which, of course, is in uh, developing countries, countries with a very different uh, social and economic structure to Australia's, um, the main target of fisheries in many countries is herbivorous um, fish, um, particularly um, parrotfish and surgeon fish. So this shows you a top-down effect. Equally, we can think of a bottom-up effect, which is the impact of adding nutrients, which promotes growth to species at the bottom of the food chain, and that can propagate upwards, again, distorting um, the structure of food webs. Top-down and bottom-up impacts are not mutually exclusive. They're both caused by lots of people being in proximity to reefs, so they tend to occur um, simultaneously. The point I want to make here is that we tend to identify threats or issues to reefs, and we tend to study them and come up with potential solutions to them in isolation. Um, but in reality, all of these issues are occurring concurrently and they are highly interactive. We'll hear uh, a talk tonight from Gary Russ, and I've, I've borrowed one of Gary's uh, slides, which shows you the biomass of coral trout inside green zones on the Great Barrier Reef and in adjacent blue zones uh, where recreational and commercial fishing uh, is, is uh, moderately heavy. And this is a fairly typical result of the type that Gary has uh, very clearly demonstrated over the last few years. Typically, there's a four- or five-fold uh, decrease, suppression of fish biomass of targeted species uh, inside uh, blue zones compared to no-take areas. So even on the Great Barrier Reef, where fishing pressure is relatively quite light compared to most coral reefs, there have been significant changes uh, in the dominance of, of targeted species, and these changes have led in turn to changes in their prey species, which um, Gary may mention tonight. Turning to the issue of bottom-up effects, this is a, a picture of, uh, of Townsville, and I'm just going to show you uh, a before and after picture. Actually, it's an after and before picture um, from uh, the Great Barrier. This is a picture taken by David Wackenfeld. It's part of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority's um, collection of photographs so showing um, landscape views of reefs uh, in the past and, and again today. So this is a fairly typical view of a muddy inshore reef today along the coast of Queensland. Lots of algae, um, a fair bit of seagrass and um, mangroves around the place. It's a low-energy environment. However, if you're John Pandolfi and you're a, a paleontologist who has the capacity to age dead corals, then you can find uh, among these lumps um, 
dead corals, and, 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 and John is undertaking a very interesting project at the moment, looking at the uh, age structure of these uh, death assemblages uh, of corals. This picture has a, a fairly characteristic outline of some hills in the background, and it was actually retaken at a place where a historical photograph was available. And so that's what that same place looked like um, in 1890. Now, when I first saw this picture a few years back, I just about fell off my chair because I don't know of anywhere on the mainland of Australia that looks like that. And certainly, uh, Dave Wackenfeld, who took this picture, looked long and hard. Sorry, took the other picture. <laughs> um, sorry, Dave, he's not that old. Um, looked long and hard to find some, some place that looked remotely like this uh, within the general vicinity, and, uh, and I showed you the picture that, that he, he found. So I think this is anecdotal evidence, but there's a lot of it, and I think uh, we probably underestimate the sorts of changes that have occurred to nearshore reefs uh, on the Great Barrier for over the last um, uh, century or so. The point I want to make uh, here is that the focus on climate change that we had uh, in the last session needs to be placed in some sort of a historical context. Uh, climate change uh, is, is, is clearly the dominant uh, issue, but a lot of other things have been happening to reefs, and climate change is a, a new human disturbance that's superimposed on a long history of uh, other impacts. So people have talked already about uh, increased uh, sea level. They've talked about storm damage. I think in the general scheme of things, those are relatively trivial issues for the world's coral reefs. Uh, at the end of the last ice age, for instance, corals reinvaded the continental shelf of Australia when sea level rose by more than 120 metres. So another few metres I don't think will affect them nearly as much as the insurance industry and the cost of coastal real estate. And, and the same, I think, is true for storm damage. Healthy coral reefs have coped for millions of years with recurrent cyclone, and I don't think... Um, that will in itself be a major issue. Of much more significance, of course, is regional scale uh, coral bleaching, uh, which uh, you heard about uh, in the last session. Um, Morgan Pratchett gave uh, an outstanding talk on the effects of the loss of corals on the rest of the coral reef uh, ecosystem. And in the longer term, ocean acidification is shaping up to be uh, a, the really uh, major issue into the future. I'll just say a couple of words about coral bleaching. Um, coral bleaching uh, has already been happening around the world. It's, there have been two major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef in 1998 and again in 2002. And the question, question, question mark uh, refers to the likelihood of another bleaching event um, uh, in the very near future, looking at uh, the uh, inevitable consequences of rising sea, sea temperatures. Um, this picture um, is typical of the sort that you see in uh, newspapers and magazines that talk about the, uh, the impact of global warming. But if you look at the corals here, it's, uh, it's, this is a monospecific stand of branching acropora. And branching acropora in this, these sorts of uh, lagoonal environments seem to be particularly susceptible to coral bleaching. So the point that uh, Lena Bay made very eloquently was that bleaching is in fact incredibly selective. And it's selective uh, at the species level and at the, the genotype uh, level. So more typically we see a checkerboard of bleached corals and less bleached or non-bleached corals when a bleaching event occurs and we can throw a transect tape down and we can actually go and quantify that. And that's what this is here. This is the percent of coral species that have bleached. Uh, so this is species A, B, C, D, E, and so on. Species A is a loser. It's a highly susceptible species. 100% of it has bleached during this particular bleaching event. But there are other species out here that have scarcely bleached at all. And so... Bleaching, as we all know now, is, is not some distant threat 20 years out into the future that may or may not come to pass. Um, it's happened twice in the Great Barrier Reef. In other parts of the world, particularly the Caribbean, the Eastern Pacific, and the Central Pacific, bleaching has occurred now six or eight times. Some of those reefs have flipped 
particularly reefs that are also polluted and overfished. But other reefs, as Bob Stenick just mentioned, are still vibrant. They still have quite high coral cover, but their species composition has changed, in some cases, quite dramatically. So the species composition in places like Tahiti and Marea today is quite different from the species composition that I first observed there in the mid-1980s. The other aspect of this sort of selectivity that we're seeing with climate change is that species differ in their ability to bounce back because of differences in their fecundity, their fertilization success, their dispersal, their recruitment cues, and so on. And these are some of the uh, issues that I mentioned earlier that I think we should also be measuring instead of just focusing on what killed uh, the corals. I want to finish up by talking about the experiment that uh, Ove mentioned very briefly in his talk, which was a fish exclusion experiment that we conducted on the Great Barrier Reef. And that, that paper has been published uh, earlier um, this year. The focus of our study was on the interaction between uh, overfishing, which we simulated with a, a fish exclusion experiment, and global warming. Um, in particular, we were interested in whether overfished reefs are less likely to be able to recover following recurrent bleaching events than reefs where local stewardship of fishing ensures that fish, particularly herbivorous fish, are, uh, are still uh, abundant. So I want to just briefly describe in a little bit more detail this experiment the, that we did. It was quite a large-scale experiment. It began after the 1998 bleaching event. We undertook it on the reef flat at Orpheus Island, which is quite a sheltered environment, which is why these structures survived uh, unscathed for uh, three years, which was the duration of the experiment. So basically, we were interested in the trajectory of recovery of corals after the 98 bleaching event with and without herbivorous fish. Um, these are quite big cages. Uh, they're five by five meters in, uh, in dimension, and they're also close to five meters tall. And the reason for that height is that that just about exceeds the tidal range there, which meant we didn't have to put roofs on them. At high tide, we could motor up in a boat and actually tie onto the cage and jump in over the top. Um, that could become problematic as the tide dropped. Um, so we put doors in the cages, and, and that door there is actually two meters um, tall, just uh, to give you uh, a, bit, a bit of scale. Um, and that's what they look like uh, at, at high tide. And yes, we did have a permit from Gabrumpa. Um, I'm not going to show you data slides uh, about the results of this experiment. I'm just going to show you two movie clips because um, uh, a picture tells a thousand words um, or whatever. I invited all my friends to take part in this experiment because it was um, uh, quite uh, expensive and a lot of trouble to set this up and to maintain it uh, over a three-year period. So we measured lots of things relating to the recovery of the corals, changes in the um, composition of seaweed, in the absence of herbivorous fish, um, and also changes in the fish themselves. So this is a movie clip taken in one of the partial cages where the fish could come and go. And unfortunately, unlike Bob, I don't have sound. But if I did, you'd hear lots of sort of Bugs Bunny-like crunch, crunch, noises, which is grazing by parrotfish. That is a juvenile coral, which is settled onto the reef substrate. There's lots of bare space here because of the mortality of corals in the 1998 bleaching event. And that space is being maintained free of macroalgae by the intense uh, grazing activities uh, of these herbivorous fish. Here's a close-up. Uh, of uh, a big parrotfish. Um, as you can see, they don't use dental floss. Um, and this is the typical uh, grazing marks uh, that parrotfish leave behind. In fact, you can measure the intensity of grazing by counting uh, the number of grazing marks. And this second movie clip begins just outside one of the full cages. I've opened the door so I can push the camera through. And this is what the, the rusty door this is what the, uh, the reef looks like three years later in the absence of herbivory. Um, that 
seaweed is, uh, is sargassum. This is the reef crest. I've never seen anything like this on the reef crest because, of course, whenever a macroalga pokes its head above the substrate in this particular zone of the reef, it's snapped off by uh, a, a grazing parrotfish. The corals are down here um, in deep shade, and so the major uh, result from this experiment was if you take away the herbivores, you get algal blooms. That wasn't uh, particularly surprising, although some people still attribute algal blooms exclusively to uh, nutrient addition, but we've shown uh, that both nutrient addition and removal of herbivores will result in this sort of phase shift. Where the fish were still grazing in our control plots, coral cover tripled over the three-year period, and the the, uh, the coral assemblages were well on their way to uh, recovery after the 98 bleaching event. The rate of recovery inside the, the cages where this algal bloom took place uh, was, was negligible because recruitment was suppressed um, by about two-thirds due to shading by this overstory of, of dense seaweed. And I just stuck in this still picture because sometimes the movie doesn't work, but this is a picture taken from inside the cage Outside are some jealous-looking parrotfish, and these are the uh, huge sargassum uh, kelp beds that we managed to grow in the absence uh, of herbivores. So this experiment, I think, firstly shows that fish are very important because of the uh, important ecological role they play, and Bob, in the last talk, used the terminology of ecosystem-based management and basically what that means is the traditional focus of looking at single stocks of targeted species is increasingly giving way to a more ecosystem-based approach where people are increasingly recognized that we need to manage not just the targeted stocks but also the ecological functions that those stocks may be performing on the reef. And clearly herbivorous fish are a crucial functional group um, for maintaining the resilience of coral reefs, their ability to cope with future bleaching events from climate change. Herbivorous fish control seaweed, and so managing fisheries can help prevent phase shifts and help to maintain resilience to future climate change. Now, I think that's an important message because there are some people out there saying that all reefs will be dead in 30 years, and I think that's not true. Uh, they will certainly continue to change. The key issue, of course, is the extent to which um, temperatures will continue to rise. And so I think we have a narrow window of opportunity to do something very serious about reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions. We have perhaps 20 years. We've come to what I've called the fork in the road. If we continue with business as usual, and we have dangerous climate change resulting in temperature rises of the four to six degree range, then I think we can forget it as far as the world's coral reefs are concerned. But I think we've got a window of opportunity. If we can hold the temperature rise to about the two degree range, then I think we'll still have a type of coral reef. It'll be still coral dominated if we can locally manage fisheries and nutrients. The species composition will change but we will still have reefs looking into the future. So rather than saying there's nothing we can do about global uh, emissions, I think we should also be focusing on local interventions, particularly managing local fish stocks and managing water quality at a catchment scale. And we can describe that as proactive management in anticipation of future um, bleaching events. So to sum up, climate change runoff and overfishing aren't separate issues, and although we've tended to categorize them even in this two-day symposium, they're highly interactive issues. Climate change is already happening. Reefs are changing, and they are degrading. It's not some distant potential threat. Local proactive interventions with, with uh, protecting fish stocks and with dealing with water quality can help to build resilience of reefs to climate change, which is a point made by uh, Laurie McCook. Reefs won't disappear if we can avoid uh, extreme uh, climate change. Um, but I'd like to make a, one last point, which isn't uh, on this slide, and that is um, there is a tendency for some people in recent times to be overconfident 
about uh, the impact of the recent rezoning on the Great Barrier Reef and other improvements due to uh, the water quality 10-year uh, plan. I think those two initiatives are fantastic and I think they will buy us some time, but they have not climate-proofed the Great Barrier Reef. So we've dealt very well, I think, with th two of the three main threats, with overfishing and with runoff. We haven't dealt at all directly with the issue of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much.